89. 89 in the red all the way. My Savior leads me. No matter what you've got going on. to continuing on our lesson on soul winning and we'll get into that in just a moment uh, you can turn to Mark chapter 2 to start off and I got some introduction comments first before we get to Mark chapter 2 and uh, I'm excited as I say often what the Lord is doing here at Lighthouse I appreciate multiple people and all the prayer requests brother Peter and other folks that mention it and pray for me and uh, when I said you all made it easy, you make it easy, you do. It's a wonderful church, and, and I, I'm not just saying this. I want to choose two different men to, to be deacons than the two we have here. Uh, Brother Gary and Brother DJ are tremendous men, and they help out tremendously spiritually with the workload. Um, obviously, you all know Brother Gary's just faithful. Faithful as can be, steadfast, wonderful uh, teaching. And uh, Brother DJ, just everything he does with the children and preaching and teaching and everything else. So you all make it easy. And that doesn't include all the other folks here and all the labor of love. And, and so it's a blessing. Uh, but I really do believe, and I'm just saying this, God is going to do great things for His namesake through Lighthouse. I believe that. And uh, I'd be foolish to think that everyone sitting here today is going to be with us for the long haul. Now, I'm not saying that in the negative sense. I'm saying that in the positive sense. Too oftentimes people get in their mind, well, oh, so-and-so is going to leave eventually. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not, not the emphasis I'm going at. I truly believe there's men sitting here today that God will move further in the ministry. They'll either be pastors one day, missionaries one day, evangelists one day. And I'm just excited that we get to be part of that. To help them out, to encourage them, to edify them, to maybe if I can bestow just a couple things that they can take with them in the ministry. 
I know I'm young and I don't have it all figured out, but I, I do. God's given me a, a, a office, the local church, to be able to help other men. And uh, so that's what we do here. We're, we're have, I have a vision, as, you, as I've told you before, to help plant churches three to five years down the road. It's still a vision. I think God's going to do it. I really do. Uh, where all the details, God will work out. I believe men will surrender and go to the mission field. I really believe that. Uh, but in the meantime, I use some of these opportunities like Sunday afternoons to allow them to develop their skills and abilities and preach and teach. And Because it's not about me, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's about a vision that God's given me that we can help further the cause of Christ and give opportunity uh, for young men uh, to be able to exercise their gifts and callings. Now, it doesn't mean everyone that preaches and teaches, I think, is going to leave. I think a lot of folks will stay around. But again, I want that opportunity. So I say that all to say this. I appreciate everyone's support. I appreciate everyone's prayer. And I'm excited for what God has for us in the future. I'm excited what God's doing. All right, let's get into uh, the, the subject this morning, uh, afternoon, excuse me. Uh, we're talking about soul winning. We've been talking about it for the last three weeks. Brother Brian picked up last week, and we'll recap that in a minute. But I just want to kind of recap where we've been so far. And this afternoon, for a few moments, and then probably one other time, closer to when we go out on the street, I'll be looking at the principles of soul winning. This is more or less the how do you do it. And I believe sometimes we approach the thing wrong. We approach the thing wrong as like, all right, you say this verse, read this verse, and get him to say a prayer. And, you know, it's all just mechanical. Um, and, and obviously we've dealt with the easy prayer room in the past and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. But I, I think if Christians would better understand why they're soul winning, what they need to do, they could be a more effective witness. Because there is no ABC. You have to be able to understand where you're at in the conversation. What is your goal? What are you trying to achieve by showing them this verse? It's not about just showing you're right and they're wrong. It's not just about showing how much you know, but you ought to have an end goal, all right? And the end goal is to get them saved, to realize that they need Jesus Christ. So I think if I show you some principles that you need to accomplish in your soul winning, it will make you a better soul winner. Not, not necessarily what verse to say, when to say, and just read them these five verses and ask them to say a prayer. It's not what I'm talking about. So that's what we're going to look at. But as I was praying about this lesson, I started thinking, you know, we really need to lay the foundation. That's what we did for the last three weeks. And the first is the fact I would remind you that we have received the promise of the Father. And we saw that is the Holy Ghost. And the importance of that is that we are empowered not by us, but who we have. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. And the Bible talks about how we're co-labors with God. So again, I just want to encourage you, it's not about your intellect, it's not about how witty you are, and although you can use those things for the glory of God. Ultimately, it's the power of the Holy Ghost that will convict and that will save. But you have that, that's the good news. The day you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit, that's the promise of the Father. Secondly, I showed you we are a purchased possession. God bought you when He gave you that Holy Spirit, he bought you. He claimed you. He, he said, that tabernacle, that body's mine. And as we looked at, with that in mind, I asked you two weeks ago, is God getting what he paid for? And that's a wonderful question that we need to remind ourselves when we live this life. See, brethren, we know this, but we need to be reminded this life is not about us and our joy and our pleasure. It's about will we bring, bring pleasure to the Lord Jesus Christ because he bought us and he owns us. And then last week, Brother Brian taught him about being an ambassador. And really, that's our high calling. We are a spokesman of a foreign country. We are a representative of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And like Brother Brian said, rightfully so, we are in Christ's stead. Now, you can tell I'm not God because I would not have chose that. <laughs> I would have sent some angels, I would have done a different plan, I would have put the Word of God across in the sky, maybe every 30 days, make an earthquake happen to make people look up. I would have came up with a different plan, but God didn't. He entrusted you, and He entrusted me, and we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it probably doesn't sound like it, but Brother Daniel, can you turn this up just a little bit? Uh, I'm half deaf, probably from the military, so if I can't hear myself, I feel like I have to scream. All right, thank you. I'll still scream regardless, but <laughs> anyways... I won't feel like I'm struggling. Thank you, brother. All right, so now let's talk about the principles. And again, 
I'm not sure if we'll cover all of these principles on this lesson. There will be a follow-up one on this. But these are things I want you to understand in regards to how to be an effective soul winner. And I believe if you'll do this, you'll be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. As i said multiple times, the winning of the soul is up to the individual. They'll choose yes or they'll choose no. But I'm talking about being an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't care who you witness to. I don't care if it's a Mormon, a Catholic, a Jehovah Witness, an atheist. All these principles are true. And if applied properly, this is all you need to know to be an effective witness. You don't have to know every doctrine of the Jehovah Witness and every doctrine of Mormonism to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is what I believe, and I, I'll say this at the get-go, I don't necessarily think there has to be this order that I'm going to show you these in, but you need to make sure that you cover these principles when witnessing. Now this one I think you always should start with. The first principle is one must realize... They're a sinner before they can get saved. Amen. Listen, you can't move on with witnessing if that person won't come to understand that first principle. And what I mean by that, we'll run these references and I'll show you that. If a person won't acknowledge that they're a sinner, I'm not moving on with the gospel or the presentation. Because listen to me, one can't get saved until they realize they're lost. So again, just remember these principles. So when you're out witnessing, that's the number one thing you have to show them. They are a sinner in need of a Savior. That's simple principle number one. Now let's look at some references to back this up. Mark chapter 2, look at verse 17. Now, some of these references I give you, if you're taking notes, these are good references. You can show someone that they need to realize they are a sinner. All right. Principle number one, you must realize, they must, excuse me, realize they're a sinner. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Listen, if they're already whole... If they're not a sinner, they don't need Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, as the Word of God says there, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And obviously you're going to go along with this thought and show them, despite what they may think, they are that sinner and they need Jesus Christ. But again, so don't worry about theology. Don't worry about doctrine and second advent and all these other things when you're out witnessing for the Lord. Because what the devil will do is try to sidetrack you on all these issues. Study sometime the woman at the well. We'll look at it briefly. But Jesus illustrates to us a fantastic way of witnessing. You'll notice there she keeps trying to draw his attention to other things, to other arguments, to other questions. And he keeps going to the fact that she needs him, the living water. But anyways... The, the, to stay on the first point is one must realize they are a sinner. Look, same thing in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Again, so you're just trying to show them, no matter what, that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And uh, next time when we talk about this, I'll try to give you some ideas about some openers and how to, you know, break the ice and get to this point. But I'm talking about once you have a conversation, if someone's willing to listen to you, the first principle you need to cover is they must realize they are a sinner. Luke chapter 19, look at verse 10. Again, it's very similar. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is why Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, so the point is, when you're dealing with someone, witnessing to them, we're going to get to the love of God, obviously. We're going to tell them what Jesus Christ did for them. But they must realize their need for a Savior. They must realize their condition that they are a sinner. Now, let me show you this. I mentioned it, but let's just look at it briefly. Look at John chapter 4. Again, this is illustrated with the Lord Jesus Christ here, dealing with the woman at the well. John chapter 4, we won't read the whole chapter, just want to emphasize this point of when the Lord is dealing with this woman, He asks her something, He says something to her that kind of seems out of place, unless you know His intention of doing so. 
Look at Luke, I'm sorry, John chapter 4, not Luke, John 4. Look at, uh, let's pick up for time's sake. Oh, let's start at verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof, thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? You notice how she tried to throw him off with the question, well, Are you greater than? Uh, is your religion better than mine? He doesn't entertain that. Well, I'm this. He doesn't entertain that. Look at look what verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. You see how he pulls the conversation right back to himself? He doesn't, he doesn't entertain about what's well is better. I'm telling you, there's some good principles in their soul winning. Be careful about trying to win every argument. You're trying to get them to Jesus Christ. Now keep reading. But whosoever drinketh of, of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water... That, shall, that I shall give him shall be in him, and a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. I thirst, uh, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Man, this is a good time, right? She finally realizes, I don't know what water you're talking about, but I've been coming to this well all the time. I want the water you're speaking of. Give it to me, I thirst. Well, a typical soul winner would say, well, bow your head, repeat this prayer, and ask Jesus to save you. Yeah. It's not what Jesus does. Look at the next verse. 16, Jesus said to her, Go call thy husbands and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in, in that saidest thou truly. Well, isn't that a mean thing to say to her? I just want this water you're telling me about. I, I thirst. And now you tell me to go call my husbands and you're embarrassed me and you tell me I had five and the one I have now is not even my husband? You know what he's going to realize? She's a sinner. Listen, I'm telling you, that's the danger. Just easy believism. Just let me rephrase that because I always like to say what is hard believism. I believe believing on the Lord is easy, right? But I'm talking about easy prayerism. That's the danger of easy prayerism. You know, just repeat this prayer. person doesn't even know what sin is. They don't know they're a sinner. They don't realize they're going to hell. But you've got them to say a prayer. Jesus doesn't do that. He said, call forth your five husbands. The point is, he wasn't trying to be mean. He's trying to realize, for her to realize who she was. A sinner. So again, the principle when witnessing, you have to get the person to realize they are a sinner. Now, this is where the Romans road usually comes in on a, on a track, right? Because the Romans road has a lot of verses on our sins. Let's look at a couple of them. But I'm trying to help you understand why you're reading them to the person. Not let me just read these three verses, right? You have to understand the principle of what you're doing. Romans chapter 3. Again, I, I found in life, God's put me in leadership responsibilities and roles for a long time now. And I, I found out a long time ago... It's one thing to have an employee or someone just do something. They'll do it like a robot. But it's much better if they know why they're doing it. If they can understand why they're doing this process. They'll be a much effective worker. And, and so that's what I'm trying to get you to see as a soul winner. I don't want you to just like, all right, take these five verses, read them to the person, then have them pray. No, I want you to understand what you're doing. And when we go to Romans, a lot of these verses deal with sin. And so the purpose is to show the person they are a sinner. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Amen. Whenever I get the opportunity, if someone is allowing me to talk to them on their door or the street or wherever it is, I'll engage them and you'll learn to do this as you become an effective soul winner. And I just simply ask them, well, do you believe that? Do you believe what the Bible says, that there's none righteous, including you? Have them think about the verse that you're reading them. You say, why? You're trying to get them to see that they're a sinner. 
Now, I always stay there and I said, well, do you know why there is none righteous? I said, look at verse 23. So Romans 3, 23, start read 3.10, show them there's none righteous. Here's why there is none righteous. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, you're talking one-on-one -on -one with the individual. At this point in time, do you say, have you sinned? And what you're trying to do is fill out, does this person understand what the Bible says about sin? Some people will say, no, no, I'm a good person. And other people, yes, yeah, I've sinned. And, but again, the goal is for you to get them to understand that they are a sinner. That's the principle. We're not moving on until we get that established. And I'll keep running reference after reference after reference after reference until someone acknowledges, at least to get me to shut up, that, yeah, I'm a sinner. Because they have to understand this first principle. All right, then again, very common, you can go Romans 5 or not, but let's just skip time's sake, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, so you know, you know there's none righteous, for all have sinned, and then you come to verse 23, and read the first part of it, for the wages of sin is death, and that's where I stop. Because I'll deal with the rest of the verse when I get to the next principle, to when I get to that principle. But right now, I'm just emphasizing the fact that this person must know that they're a sinner. And at this point in time, I typically stop and say, listen, this is how I know that you're a sinner. And this is how you know that I am a sinner. And everyone born in this world is a sinner. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So you're going to get your payment someday. You're going to die. You are a sinner. And get see again, will they admit it? If they admit it, say, well, I got worse news for you. It's not just physical death, but it's eternal damnation. And show them Revelation chapter 21. Very familiar. Again, this follows the typical Romans road with some other verses thrown in there. You're getting the person to realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Revelation chapter 21. Now, you have to pray. Every circumstance is not the same. Sometimes you'll have more time than others. Sometimes you'll have less. And so you pray as God leads you of what verses you show, how many you show. Again, it depends on who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a very self-righteous person who thinks they're good and their goodness is going to get them to heaven, I would slow down and show them a whole bunch of verses, what the Bible says. You say, why? What's the power of God? It's, it's right here is the power of God. Keep showing them the references that shows them they're a sinner. And then move on. But Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful. Now again, you could give them some context. You could say this is in the future. This is about New Jerusalem, so on and so forth. But Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And you simply show them there. Well, you understood you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. I told you it's not just physical death. Here's the verse that shows you. It's eternal damnation, the second death in the lake of fire. But do you notice what was in that list? All liars. And I ask them at this point in time, have you ever lied before? Well, yeah. Well, according to the Bible, where are you going to go? The lake of fire. Again, you're trying to get them to realize it's not about just speeding through verses. You're trying to let the Word of God work effectually in their heart, if they'll believe it, what the Bible says. But you want to let them see they're a sinner and their destination is the devil's hell because they're a sinner. Now, a couple other references. That's kind of the route I would go to show someone they're a sinner. If you have someone that's a little bit more stubborn, a couple others I like to use is go to John chapter 3. Again, there's no set formula. All I'm trying to get you to see this afternoon is you need to have them understand this first principle. And that first principle is they are a sinner. And you pray that God leads you, God guides you as you witness. But I would encourage you to have these references written down somewhere, maybe in the front of your Bible, that says first principle, they're a sinner. I need to show them they're a sinner. You can have these references and a whole bunch of others. But this is where you need to start. You need to show them that they are a sinner. Now, again, maybe you got someone that's stooped in religion. Maybe you got someone who's morally a good person and they don't quite understand what you just showed them. Or should I say they don't quite believe it? Here's some wonderful verses, John chapter 3. And you set them up because of verse 16 is such a wonderful passage, and it is. 
For God so loved the world, verse 16, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But you, you can have a little conversation there about John 3, 16, what a wonderful passage that is, but you don't stop there. I said, have you ever read, I usually ask them, have you ever read the verses after John 3, 16? No? Okay, let's read them. Verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but but that the world through him might be saved. Interesting. Why is that? Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And at this point in time, I would tell him, see, the Bible declares, Sir, ma'am, you are condemned already. You're just waiting for the sentence to be carried out. You might not understand it. You might not believe it. But the Bible says you're condemned already. Amen. Look at one more, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. And that's present tense. And what you want to show them is, yeah, you have physical life, but you'll never have eternal life. You'll never have spiritual life. And the Bible says the wrath of God abideth on you. And again, so what is the whole principle of point number one? Well, I've told you multiple times. It's to show them they're a sinner. And again, these are not the only seven verses or references. You can use a whole bunch. The Bible is filled with how wicked and vile and undone and without hope man is. Take your choices, any ones you want to use. But you have to get this first principle, whoever you're witnessing to. And so this is where I typically start. And we'll maybe look at one more, just a few references, and uh, maybe go five minutes over today and we'll be done. But usually this is where I start. If I, the person's not going to allow me uh, to give them the whole gospel, uh, of course, at the end, I'll conclude, but Jesus died for you. But I'm going to leave them with, listen, sir, ma'am, the Bible's clear. The wages of sin is death. The Bible's clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible's clear. You need Jesus Christ. And ma'am, sir, he died for you. And you know, provoke their thoughts. But at a minimum, you want to show them who they are before a holy God and their need. All right, so that's principle number one. So what is principle number two? And this one will be quicker. Second principle, and again, it doesn't have to be in this order, but it needs to be somewhere in your witnessing presentation, however you want to say it, they can't save themselves. What good is it if you get them lost, but they think they can save themselves? So you have to make sure they understand, yes, they're a sinner, yes, they're going to die and go to hell, but they cannot save themselves. Let's look at some familiar passages. Again, encourage you to write them down. So when you're dealing with people on this principle, you can have them for when we go to the street this coming year. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Very familiar. You should, probably most of you can quote these. You should know these. It's always good to open up the Word of God. Let the person see them for themselves. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And again, that's really easy to elaborate on. Say, listen, sir, ma'am, God's not going to let you into heaven by your good works. If you did, you could boast on why you got there. Salvation is you can't earn it yourself. Salvation is a free gift. All right. A couple other references to support that. And then we'll close out for the day. Look at Romans chapter 4. Another Reference, especially after you just read them, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Romans chapter 4. Again, this is to the church. Pauline doctrine. You want to make sure they understand that they can't save themselves. You know why most people will say, okay, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I can earn my way into heaven. They won't say it. But in their mind, because of what society's taught them and what religion has taught them, well, as long as my good outweighs my bad, then I'll be fine. I can earn my way there. No, you can't. Salvation's a free gift. You can't earn it. All right? So you're not saved by works. It is a gift of God. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Didn't we just read that salvation is by the grace of God? 
So if it was works, it wouldn't be grace. The Bible says it would be debt. It'd be something God owed you. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, you're showing them these verses, explaining to them that they cannot save themselves. A couple more and we're done. Look at Titus. Timothy Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Verse 5, the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You say, what's the point there? It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So again, if you got someone who realizes they're a sinner, but they think there's something that you can do, you read them Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You read them Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. You read them Titus 3, 6, or 5, excuse me. And there's other references. Write down Isaiah 64, 6. You know that reference, right? All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's a wonderful reference to show them. So what if you're dealing with a religious person? We'll close out here. John chapter 3. And we're done for today. John chapter 3. Dealing with a religious person, I usually go to the book of John. You say, why? Because you're dealing with a religious person in the book of John. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. I usually typically will stop there and ask him, do you know what a Pharisee is? And if they say yes, I say, okay, you understand. He wore the religious garment. He went to the synagogue on the outward appearance. Everyone thought he was right with God. He had all the things outwardly, but look what Jesus said. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And again, I'll just usually stop there. You can continue reading it if you want. But I would sit there and elaborate. i say, here's a religious man. Went to the synagogue and wore all the religious garment. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Religion won't save you. Your works won't save you. Nothing can save you but Jesus Christ. All right, so again, what you're trying to do, and we'll pick up uh, next time when I teach, it'll be a few weeks, on the principles of soul winning. And I know some of this can be mundane and some of this can be monotonous. Some of you already know this. But what we need to do is when we go out this year, we need to learn to be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not always easy. And sometimes it's studious. Sometimes it's just sitting down and writing down the verses. But here's my goal. I hope this year when some of you knock on doors and you give an opportunity to talk to someone, you say, all right, let me pray that I can show that this person's a sinner. Lord, let me read one or two verses. Maybe they take heed to those, all right? Let me, let me show this person now that they realize they're a sinner, that they can't save themselves. Here, can I show you that in the Bible? Look at here, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at Titus chapter 3. And maybe they take heed to that. And then we'll move on next time I teach on some other principles. So if you know what you're doing and why you're doing it, I believe you'll be a better witness. I'll be a better witness. But if we just have some references, and I just tell you, I'll read them this one, this one, and this one, and at the end, ask them if they want to get saved. You don't even realize what you're doing. And I don't believe you'll be an effective witness. But I believe if you understand these principles, and you understand salvation, we can be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm done. As I said before, the reason we stand on the street corner, the reason we door, do go door knocking, the reason we're going to see it in the park this year is not to build Lighthouse Baptist Church. God will give the increase, and He has. He will continue to. We're going out there to witness to the lost. If someone professes to be saved and they don't have a church, praise the Lord, come, we'll be glad you grow with us. But our intention is not to invite lost people out. Our intention is to say, hey, I'm here today. And you can say, I'm from Lighthouse. I'm here today to tell you the greatest news you ever heard. What is that? You're a sinner in need of a Savior. <laughs> and they'll, they'll listen to you. They'll let you open the Bible. Let me show you. There's, you can't save yourself. There's nothing that can save you but Jesus Christ. And move on to those principles. And of course, when they won't listen to you, you say, oh, here, can I at least give you a gospel track? 
Because that's what those tracts contain, those verses on those principles. And many testimonies of many people of folks getting saved by a gospel tract. Thank God for gospel tracts. And uh, so again, I know some of this can be repetitive, but I do pray that this year we have a better understanding as a church. We grow stronger and some of our younger Christians, and even older Christians, would realize what we're doing. We're going out telling this lost and dying world how they can be saved. We're telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think through this lesson and the next one when I teach on it, if you understand the principles, have some references written down, you can be effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for this time to open the Word of God and to study. Lord, I do pray that you would make us effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, get all the honor and glory. I pray you would bless our efforts to glorify our Savior this year. And Lord, I pray that we would be a lighthouse to this lost and dying world. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless and dismiss us. And may we serve you this week and today. And thank you for all the wonderful uh, fellowship and preaching and teaching we've had. May you get the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's, uh, for the junior church.